Marcy Sklo, welcome to Going Deeper. We are in uh, part two of a wonderful interview with Jules Shemetsky, and we'll just jump right in. Um, Jules, we were just talking about these two articles that came from late 60s and early 70s. And um, for those who are joining that weren't part of the other one, I just want to read this last sentence about um, how you were shining the light on other parts of the, um, um, the American landscape of, of writers and, uh, and that you brought, you, know, you brought them into the limelight. Because I want to talk to you about your involvement with the black movement and the ways that you... Um, participated even as it, you know in a young age th at, uh, with the NAACP but I want to just uh, it's now going to be out of context in a way but um, here's what Jules says are at the heart of the changing American dilemmas of a changing America's dilemmas the racial grounds of the southern tragedy the stakes involved in the acculturation of immigrant populations, the assertion of a black ethos, and the terms of woman's entrapment within our cultural assumptions. And I read it again partly because you articulate so beautifully the same problems that we have today. The immigrants have changed, but in Good terms... Point you know, other, uh, other parts of the, the populations that you've talked about here, the black ethos, very big, you know, racist problems that we're still having in our country, and also issues of women's uh, rights and all that stuff. So can, can we move into the, the whole thing with the African-American um, movement and your involvement in that? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I didn't go into this earlier, but it comes back to me now. How, how did you change? How, what did you learn? And there were so, so many learning experiences in, in New York and Brooklyn when I was growing up. When I was 14, I also used to box a lot in the streets uh, for entertainment. <laughs> Boxing was a big thing. And there was a black uh, kid my age named, and, named Oliver White, and we would box, and one day, it was the summertime, we were tired, and we had done about 10, 12 rounds, and we sat down against the wall, and out of the blue, in 1942, the Japanese mm -hmm. had attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, December. He said, we, I talked about the war a little bit, he said, I hope the Japanese win. I said, what? Mm -hmm. I said, that's such an unthinkable thought. I mean, it never <laughs> would have occurred to me. Yeah. And then I got it. I got it. I understood why you said that. Yeah. And what, why did he say that? Well, because of the condition of black people in America. Okay. Was yeah. A, and there was a movement within the black movement. The time I learned later from one of the professors in the Afro-Am department has written about involvement with the Japanese in the 30s. Wow. Af some Africa. But that was not the point. The sure. point was the, the alienation. Yeah. Uh, then I worked in a, in a dry clean after school, and the presser was a wonderful black man who had been in the 369th Regiment yeah. in the First World War, and he taught me all about that alternate history, wow. and so on and so on. And then I worked after school in, a, in Bedford Stuyvesant in a custard stand, and I used to be friendly with some of the customers, nine-tenths of whom were black, African American, one woman in particular was very friendly. And I said, Oh, I had just been visiting my relatives in Washington, D.C. I like Washington, D.C. a lot. She said, You like Washington, D.C.? It's a Jim Crow town. Mm -hmm. It's a line from Muddy uh, Lead Belly. It's a gin. Yeah. Uh, so all these things change you. Yes. And you begin to understand things. So, but go ahead. No, that's then, then, perfect. then when I got here, 
let's jump to the yeah. issues of Amherst and everything else. When we started the review, one of the great people who founded it with me and a few others was Sidney Kaplan, mm -hmm. who was a professor at the English department. He was away the semester we got it started, getting his PhD at Harvard. But then he came back and we recruited him. And he and Leonard Baskin, mm -hmm. we, and they changed the magazine beautifully. And Sidney was a pioneer in black studies and black history and was black he, art. Was he black? No, no, no. Sidney Kaplan. Kaplan, was, Jewish guy. Yeah. Gotcha. And Leonard also was a great radical and great artist. Yeah. And I owe them still. They're wonderful people and they created the beauty of the Mass Review at the beginning. But with Sid, we, we were open to black writers, black poets, black artists. Mm -hmm. With Leonard knew many of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did 10 years of the Mass Review uh, that Sid and I collected relevant articles about the movement Mm -hmm. We have a lot of articles about blacks and literature and stuff like that. But we only pick things where we have a huge anthology called Black and White in American Culture. Yeah. And that is still very readable. It went through three editions and it has marvelous stuff in it. So that was 10 years we, we were cultivating that. Yeah. And then uh, when I became, you know, and, uh, when Sidney had left, he wanted me to be his successor early in the 60s. And John Hicks and I were co-editors. And I said to John, we're going to continue with the blacks for the duration, as they used to say in the war. Mm -hmm. so, well, it's not just a one-time thing. Sure. And while I was in uh, Germany one year, in the early 60s, I, I spent a week with John Hope Franklin, the great historian mm -hmm. of black life. And we bonded, we got friendly. We gave a week of seminars to German gymnasium teachers. Mm -hmm. And when I became editor in the early 60s, I told John, let's go down, let's talk to John Hope Franklin, who was then chairman of the English Dep uh, History Department at Brooklyn College, my alma mater. Yeah. I said, let's go talk to him about people we should solicit for writing for the review. And as we went down, and John Hope Franklin helped us. He was a gracious, lovely man. Yeah. He gave us a couple of names, including Sterling Brown at Howard and mm -hmm. Saunders Redding at Cornell, mm. great black uh, critics and scholars. Yeah. And Sterling was a great poet as well. And through Sterling Brown, we got three of the best. We said when Sid Kavanaugh became chair, a graduate director of our mm -hmm. programs, he solicited Sterling Brown at Howard, so he said, I'll pay you. So we got Mike Thelwell, Esther Terry, oh, uh, te uh, Esther's husband, uh, and uh, Bernard Bell, among wow. others. So and we then that, that became the Afro... Um, uh, yeah, department. Mike Thelwell and Sid were really the and architects of that department. Okay. Mike Thelwell mainly. Mostly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then he recruited people he knew from SNCC and elsewhere. Right. And uh, Mike Thelwell, can, uh, he, was, he had four stories in our anthology, huh. great ones. One was called Fisher Jumping and Cutting His Eye, Notes on the Del Mississippi Delta. Wow. And, and that's been reprinted many times. The only yeah. article we ever published that was reprinted more was Chinua Achebe's hmm. uh, critique of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Oh, gosh. It's the most republished piece we ever played. I, I'm going to be back in the library after our And that would change the course of uh, literary criticism about Africa and wow. the Third World. So interesting. Okay. But anyway, I got involved yeah. in that. And that was most of my involvement through the Afro Am department with Mike. and. We continued whenever there were causes that needed doing, helping, we participated. Yeah. Okay, so I also want to talk about Amherst as a town. Uh -huh. 
And in 1969, you were asked to um, evaluate the Amherst schools uh, oh, regarding that's... racism. Yep. And um, that's an, that's an interesting I would story. love to hear what you found then and okay. what you think now. <laughs> I'd served on the uh, town meeting for a few years, mm -hmm. ultimately about seven years altogether. But the town meeting, a, a young man, Sandy Darity, whose father was a professor mm. at the university yes, and of head course. of the health sciences, great man who just he died just a few passed. Yeah, months I, ago. Yeah. Uh, but Sandy was 17 years old, and he led the charge of racism in the Hammer School. So the town com mm. the committee appointed a committee there were, I must have been about seven of us representing all shades of political opinion. We had Republicans, mm -hmm. we had uh, guys who drove trucks with guns in the back, <laughs> and yeah. we had Sandy and me and a retired high school teacher. And we started investigating one night a week, two nights a week. The first of the school system, then we broadened out the police to the mm. construction, in, and we found racism everywhere. Yeah. And uh, we were going to publish it, but it was a dead, deadline. We finally got it published in a little booklet that I, I put together with this re wonderful retired high school teacher. And we wrote the little booklet on the history of it. I don't know where oh, it is. I gosh. had a, one copy, which I gave to the ah. graduate school at UMass. <clears throat> the, is, is but anyway, uh, a few months ago or a couple of weeks ago when Darity mm -hmm. passed, and there was a big crowd at his memorial service at the funeral parlor. Yeah. And there was Sandy, who made a brilliant kid at 17. And there he was. He's now a full professor of economics at Duke. Wonderful. And his daughter, uh, Darity's sister, is a lawyer on the coast. Yeah. And I, we said condolences to the family, but I said, remember the committee we were on, I said, yeah, he says, uh, I said, has, things haven't changed much yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in 40 years or whatever. No, have you followed some of the things that have been, you know, happening in the schools and in town? As much as possible. You know, my kids got they're, out of the school system so many years ago <clears throat> that I I trusted everything was going all right, but who knows. Yeah. And uh, friends of mine who taught there went on to other things. So. Was there any ever any relationship between working on racism issues in Amherst in terms of the town and the African American um, department at UMass Afroam? Like you know, there were such always there are not in the well, past. It must have been a resource for people who wanted to know anything because yeah. they're a lot of, a very good people. Very good people in that. There was something I wanted to mention, which sort of slipped my mind okay. uh, about all that, but it'll come back. It'll come it. back. Um, so, was there? Okay, I, now I want to talk about the Institute for Advanced Study in Humanities. Oh my goodness! Now, uh, tell, what oh, is that? Oh, I know. I, may, oh. may I? Yes. One member of the committee was a wonderful woman, wonderful woman who was a New York, a Puerto Rican woman who married a black, an African-American man from Amherst who was yeah. a maintenance worker at the Amherst campus. She had several children. Yeah. And she was good on the committee. And one line she said to me, which I don't want to ever forget, was to the whole committee, she said this, not to me. She says, you don't know what Amherst has done to me and my family. Yeah. Wow. So one can imagine, but I won't go into that. Okay. But the, the kids came out all right, as it turned out. Good. <laughs> Good. Resiliency. Yeah. Yeah. One of them became assistant tennis coach at Amherst College. Oh, great. <laughs> That's great. Um, so what's the connection between IOSH and this kind of work, this social justice Well, it's work? a little broader in some respect. The initial task handed to me by the provost who appointed me to this, he wanted to start this out outfit. He had come from New York, and he had been head of uh, the NYU 
Institute for the Study of Humanities, which is a very high class, very good place, yeah. for a lot of main people, members of it. But um, the big thing was to raise the flag for the humanities, make it visible, the arts and humanities. And does that mean interdisciplinary? Whatever, like yeah, if it was, yeah, into the secondary is part of it. Yeah, but mainly, so I looked around for where to house this place. There was a various suggestion, okay. and I picked a little place called the East Experiment Station, which was a wreck at the time. Yeah. But we built it up because it was right near the, where the science people start, right uh -huh. across from the Letterly Graduate Center. Yeah. So we wanted to always bring in as many scientists as we could to discourse with humanists and social scientists yeah. and yeah. so on. Didn't work out that strongly, <laughs> but I always got a few, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we ran seminars, we ran conferences, hmm. and the seminars were very successful by and large, which gave it, there, there it was often interdisciplinary. I tr tried to get the best people from various departments <coughs> to get re release time because I had the provost backing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they could give a seminar for other faculty members. So it was the one place faculty members could get together who otherwise wouldn't talk to each other. Right. So that was the interdisciplinary sure. component. Yeah. And that worked out pretty well over the years. Yeah. Were there other models of that happening on campus? No. I don't think so. Yeah. So that in itself was a... A People still remember it, but I left it, I, I did it from about 1981 to 91 or something like that. Uh -huh. And then uh, somebody else took it over for 10 years and then the newest provost canceled oh, it. Oh, so it's not there anymore. No. Wow. It's all right. It did yeah. its job at the time. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Let's see what else we want to talk about because well. we've talked about so much. There's a couple of things I wanted to get back to if we had time, which we do, about your early life. And one was about your mother's family. Oh. Because uh, when I talked to you before the interview and you told me about Woodbine, New oh, Jersey, that's right. yeah, that's... and you said, look it up. And I said, okay. Did and I look... did, of course. Oh. What a cool thing. All right, okay. I'm glad you brought that up. It's a very interesting story. Yeah. <sighs> it goes back to the Dreyfus affair. Yeah. And uh, I was interviewed by a high school student uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, she never heard of Dreyfus. I have to explain. I you might have to explain now. Too, well, that a was the, the great case in the 1890s where an Alsatian Jew named Dreyfus, who was a major, I think, and captain. He was a captain in the French army. And uh, he was accused of uh, giving secrets to the Germans of mm -hmm. some armaments. And it became a great cause celebre in France and all over Europe, all over, all over the world. But in France especially, it was split between the Dreyfus Arts and the anti-Dreyfus Arts. It was the ancien regime, the noble, the old aristocracy, mm -hmm. the church, the uh, aristocracy, the big businessmen, yeah. Um, on the one hand, the army, and the other side were the f Republicans, the French, the Liberté, the Galité, Fraternité, yeah. and uh, socialists and uh, liberals and so on. And th that split is still in, mm. s exists in France, yeah. a very potent force. It, it explains Vichy and all kinds of things. Huh. Anyway. At that point, that became a big stimulus to Zionism and Theodor Herzl, called the father of Zionism, one of the fathers, actually. But he uh, said, after he, he was a reporter, he reported on the Dreyfus thing where he was railroaded and convicted and sent to Devil's Island off the coast of Guyana. It's a horrible place. Say the year again. I'm sorry. Excuse me? What year? Are we? The 18, late 1890s. Okay. I'm with you. Go ahead. I mean, if, if anybody could go see a, a old, an old movie about uh, Emil Zola, they have a wonderful depiction of the trial and, oh, and of Joseph Schildkraut as Dreyfus and being re living in this yeah. rat infested hole in Devil's Island. But anyway, uh, he gets convicted. 
And, but then the uproar continues. And Zola wrote a very famous piece called J'accuse mm -hmm. against the government. Right. Against the, ultimately, at the beginning of the 20th century, they finally realized, I mean, there were people in the army who, did, who were adamantly anti-Dreyfus, but there were few who looked at the facts and the data, and they finally caught the real culprit. Some weapon oh. Don had been sent to Germany, but it was a, mayor, a major Esterhazy, uh -huh. not Nothing. Jewish. Not, yeah. not a, and so he was finally released, yeah. begrudgingly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, interestingly, he, he always wanted to go back to the army. <laughs> he was, he wow. loved the French army. Yeah. And he wound up a general in the First World War <coughs> defending the city of Metz in huh. the Alsace. Yeah. Anyway, but that's part of the history. The other part that's significant for my family yeah. was it was the uh, beginning of sort of the movement, the, the realization of how deep anti-Semitism was in Europe at that time. Yeah. And Herzl and others said, get out, go to Palestine, become Zionist, build a state. Or, and then there was another person, a very influential figure, who started the Israelite Association of France, a wealthy philanthropist named de Hirsch, yeah. Baron de Hirsch. He got a baronetcy. And he said, get, get the heck out of Europe, go back to the land. So he started settlements in Palestine, Argentina, and Woodbine, New Jersey. Ah, there we go to Woodbine. There we go to Woodbine. <laughs> and my grandfather, my mother's father, they lived in a little village near Lublin. In Poland. In Poland, Lublin, yeah. near Auschwitz. But they lived in a little village. And he was a cattle handler. He would take a cow for one of the farmers and go to the weekly market and sell it, get a, a little commission. Mm -hmm. And he hated it, but he was not allowed to own land because right. he was Jewish. So when de Hirsch started this colony, mm -hmm. he decided to take him up on it, and he went to Woodbine, New Jersey. Wow. And he, he had a, a dairy farm for a few years, and he brought his family over. And uh, it's still, and it, it was a, they were not a collective, they were cooperative. Mm -hmm. They owned, each one owned something. <clears throat> and they started an agricultural research center, the first one in the state of New Jersey, which still exists. Oh. Wow. But the town is now 90% African American. Yeah. <clears throat> Although the synagogue still exists, beautiful Georgian synagogue. Is it brick? Brick, Georgia yeah. brick. Okay, I, I did see a photo of it. And they have a cafe where you get a good cup of coffee called the European. And nobody knows why it's called <laughs> the European. But the main crossroads of this town are yeah. uh, Washington, George Washington, and De Hirsch. And De Hirsch. <laughs> yeah, that is a great story. <laughs> and we have a, a couple more minutes. You had said something to me about your father's story. Is, there, is that a two-minute story you could Well, you could I'll try to make it quick. Okay. Uh, <coughs> he came from the Russian side of the uh, Polish-Russian border, a little place called Volinia between Belarus and the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And his older brother had come to America after he had served in the Tsarist army. He hated mm -hmm. it. He got out. And he brought my father over when my father was 17, just before the First World War, yeah. which was fortunate. Sure. He would have been killed because they were between the two great armies, yeah. just like in the Second World War. Right, right. And then after the war, well, his sisters were kept to stay behind with their families and his parents. And, and he used to send them money in the 30s. For, and they were all wiped out by the Nazi troops mm. in the two weeks in August of 1941, in the first big invasion yeah. of the Germans. But there were two other brothers who had come in the 20s. They couldn't get in after the First World War. They couldn't uh, get into America because of the racist immigration laws. <laughs> well, not yeah. only Muslims today, uh, right. but people from Eastern and Southern Europe, Slavs, Italians, Jews, yeah. were being kept at Poles, were not desirable. Through, yeah. through the white establishment, white uh, Anglo-Saxon. And uh, so they went to Brazil, where they mm. thrived, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a big family in Brazil. 
Okay. And I visited them about five years the first time. Mm. Quite a family. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Quite an interesting story. Yeah. Wow. And De Hirsch, I learned, also started colonies there and elsewhere later on. Yeah. That's great. We're a world people. So, you know, <laughs> we're a world people. And we do see these kind of trends of things happening again and again. The faces change a little bit, but this, the same fear that Fears. it's fear. Yeah. Fear and hatreds. Yeah. That have to work, we have to work hard to ameliorate it. And, and in our country, the, the primal sin is slavery, which we never have really fully addressed and all its consequences. Absolutely. That's what I devote myself to more wow. than Wow, that's wonderful. It's absolutely true. We've never healed and uh, acknowledged and healed. And you've spent a lot of time in Germany. I think they've done a little better job coming Not the to Austrians, terms. but the Germans. <laughs> the Austrians, <laughs> the Austrians were Austrians. worse than the Germans. Yeah, yeah. They welcomed Hitler yeah. much more fervently, as I, as I think, as I suspect. We could go on and on for I know. a long time. It's so great to talk to you. Well, really thank interesting. you. It's a pleasure to be here with you and this wonderful oh. institution. Yeah, Emerson I actually Media. was a member of when they first started. Really? At ACTV? Yeah. Yeah. Way back when. Yeah. Well, that brings me good segue to my gratitude to the staff and the volunteers of Amherst Media and also to all of the people who contribute to Amherst Media. They're always needing some fund fundraising um, uh, to do. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next time on Going Deeper. <laughs>